Good afternoon, Cleveland. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me here at the beautiful Mimi Ohio Theater for my third State of the City address. We are currently in the country's largest performing out center outside of New York City in Cleveland, folks. We forget that too often. That deserves a round of applause. The work we are doing takes a village. Transforming our city takes many, many people working hand in hand. Now, I won't be able to recognize every one of you today, but you know who you are and what an important role you play. First, to the city of Cleveland team, together we've overcome challenges and come together as one force for change. To the nearly 8,000 of you, you are the front lines. From plowing the snow and picking up the waste bins, to the teams who maintain our parks and our public spaces, to our heroes in EMS, fire, and police, you are the heart of Cleveland. And I couldn't be more grateful for your unwavering commitment. To my esteemed colleagues on city council, Thank you for your collaboration and for serving the residents of Cleveland so faithfully. Together, we pursued an ambitious agenda that puts Clevelanders first, and I am proud to work alongside you. And special thanks to our incredible county, state, and federal partners. We work together every single day to keep this ship steered in the right direction. Because if Cleveland thrives, our region thrives, our state thrives, and the country thrives. And above all, thank you to every resident of Cleveland. It remains the honor of my lifetime to serve you. As a son of this city, I've witnessed too often in others a feeling that we are a city past our prime, a sense that our best days are behind us. But I strongly push back on that thinking every chance I get. It's a big reason why I ran for mayor in the first place. We may forget it, but Cleveland once had more inventors and more millionaires than any city its size. Cleveland dominated entire industries and created new ones too. Our, our entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well, but We've just lost some of our confidence, but it's time to regain it. Because I'm confident in the Cleveland of today. I'll say it again, the second largest theater district in the country. The, the first major American city led by a black mayor. The birthplace of rock and roll and a global hub for healthcare, innovation, and so much more. I, I feel this energy when I'm walking in our neighborhoods. I feel it in our classrooms among our, our young people. I feel it in the corridors of City Hall. We are taking on our biggest challenges with urgency every day and investing in our city's future for generations to come. This is our moment. I took office with a fresh perspective and energy to build a city hall that works for you. But before you can tackle big things, you need a firm foundation. Just give him a second, give him a second. 
Give him a second. Give him a second. Give him a second. Let's clap our hands for freedom of speech in this country. That's why I love America so much. That's right. That's why we love free speech. Now, where was I? So when I got to office in my first week at City Hall, the roof was literally leaking buckets of rainwater. In the first six months of my term, I was in a hurry to get everything done. We needed urgency, don't get me wrong, we still do. But just as important is leading with purpose and patience. Building trust and relationships takes time. Understanding the complex issues our city faces takes time. We can't win by rushing to the finish line. This is our movement and we have to move as one. To that end, we just completed a 10-year strategic audit focused on bringing our city operations into the 21st century. We did a deep dive with staff from across the enterprise to develop a roadmap for meaningful change. We're making the easy things easy, like streamlining the payment process for our vendors and contractors because it should not take months to pay somebody to cut the grass in our city. We're also digitizing the procurement process and adding self-service options for things like birth and death certificate requests to make it easier for residents to work with the city and access the resources they need. And for the first time in decades, we launched a new and improved website that's mobile friendly and built with residents in mind. And I'm pleased to announce that next week, we are launching the first iteration of our new open data portal to provide the public with increased transparency and easy access to a wide range of city records. <laughs> promises made, promises kept. Our city service hotline 311 is now available 24-7 seven days a week, and we are close to launching a web version that allows our residents to report and track the status of requests just as they would a FedEx package. And for the first time since President Eisenhower, we we reevaluated our trash collection route system to provide more consistent service that doesn't have our teammates working into the night. We've, we've updated our HR practices to attract and retain the best and brightest of public service, including modernizing our vacation and parental leave policies. But here's one of my favorites. I hope you all have enjoyed the new smart parking system all across downtown Cleveland. You see, you have to get the basics right. And as a son of a cop, nothing is more fundamental to me than public safety. If we can't build a Cleveland where every resident feels safe and trusts law enforcement to answer in their hour of need, we can't achieve much else. Safety comes first. It will always come first. The Warehouse District shooting last summer was devastating. Another act of 
senseless gun violence. And despite the state tying our hands, we need to exhaust every option to prevent these tragedies in our city. One of the ways my administration has responded is through our RISE initiative, raising investment in safety for everyone. RISE is an all hands on deck approach to both stop crime before it starts and guarantee an effective response when it occurs. In collaboration with local, state, and national law enforcement agencies, we've made hundreds, hundreds of felony warrant arrests and confiscated scores of illegal guns endangering our streets. For the first time in decades, city administration, police leadership, and both, both police unions, the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association and Fraternal Order of Police work together on an agreement to support officer retention and recruitment. The agreement increases wages by up to 14% for all officers, raising overall pay by up to 25% in just two years. Just two years. We've also established 12-hour shifts for our officers, meaning more time off, less costly overtime payments, and ultimately safer neighborhoods. This dynamic model spreads out staffing and increases police presence on our streets. In fact, we're not far from optimal patrol numbers in our five districts with this change. We've also raised cadet pay, added new reimbursement options for state trained certified cadets, and increased the maximum age for recruits to help us bring the best talent to Cleveland. Not just to fill our ranks, but to build a force that our city can trust to answer the call. And it's working, Cleveland. Applications to join the police force are up by 45%. And this past Monday, I welcomed a new class of 52 cadets to the police academy. This, this is larger than the previous four classes combined. We've also doubled the number of social workers in our co-response teams across every police district. And, and in 2023, our crisis intervention team resolved more than 4,800 interactions without an arrest or citation. That's nearly 100% of the calls they were involved with. And we know that not every police call warrants a traditional response, and it's critical we provide the mental health support our residents deserve. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the major investments we've made in EMS. 19 new ambulances hit the street last year, and we're also implementing a lateral transfer program where paramedics with at least one year of experience will be paid $27 an hour upon hire. We know that partnerships are key to delivering on our promise to keep Cleveland safe. Last year, we expanded shot spotter into all five police districts and grew our smart camera sharing program, integrating more than 2,300 cameras at convenience stores, churches, retail shops, office buildings, and residences all across Cleveland. And the latest police data shows that nearly 40 lives, 40 lives have been saved in our city due to faster response times thanks to ShotSpotter. <laughs> Cleveland Police also work with the ATF and other agencies to tear down multiple gun trafficking enterprises. And just this summer, we'll be launching our new Crime Gun Intelligence Center right here in Cleveland. 
and the data shows these investments are working. Homicides were down last year for the second year in a row. And since the pandemic, homicides have decreased by 14%. 14%. And our homicide solve rate is currently close to 80%, significantly higher than the 55% national average. This, this is what modern intelligent policing for the 21st century looks like. This is how we solve cases and save lives in our city. But when we grieve for the victims, of gun violence, we too often neglect the effect it has on the families and friends left behind. Organizations like the Brenda Glass Trauma Center do inspiring work to help survivors of violence piece their lives back together. But this work shouldn't be needed as much as it is in our city. This year marks a somber anniversary, 10 years since Tamir Rice was killed by a Cleveland police officer while playing with the toy gun in a city park. That's right. That's right. A 12-year-old boy doing what 12-year-old boys do. Endangering no one, hurting no one. Let him finish, let him finish, let him finish. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, now where were we again? His mother, Miss Amaria Rice, who is here with us this afternoon, continues to fight for justice. Since Samira's murder, Ms. Rice has committed her life to Tamir's legacy as a catalyst for change. And we are committed, we are committed to honoring Tamir's legacy through community oversight and police accountability. Now I wanna be crystal clear that as my administration works to support, recruit, and retain officers, we remain steadfastly committed to police reform and doing the hard work to get out from under the consent decree. We all have the same goal, safer communities. But a safer Cleveland needs comprehensive gun reform and tools to crack down on illegal gun trafficking. And as mayor, I work with anyone in the legislature, regardless of party or politics, who has a passion and sense of urgency to solve our illegal gun problem. It's time for us to put people over politics on this issue once and for all. And I know we can work together. I've seen it with our state and federal partners. I've seen it with the success of both RISE and our work with Republican State Senator Nancy Manning to pass Senate Bill 88, erasing the records of thousands of Clevelanders with minor marijuana possession charges, eliminating barriers to employment, and giving people a second chance that they deserve. To deliver on public safety, we need to foster community and fix systems where they are failing people. As a first step, we've established a $10 million neighborhood safety fund to provide sustained support for evidence-based programs that address the root causes of violence in our community and meet residents where they are. Last year, we allocated the first $1 million in grant making to 29 community programs, and I've been so blown away by the work that these organizations are doing. Hank Davis, 
started the ICONS program in 2002 with the mission to make a positive impact on the community as a violence interrupter. Today, ICONS focuses on the work of preventing violence by getting ahead of it. Through a mentorship program at Hannah Gibbons Elementary School in Collinwood, Hank works with a group of fourth and fifth grade boys, many of whom have experienced significant trauma to offer new opportunities and a sense of community. Most of the young men who come through ICON's program graduate from high school. Many are now in college or working in the trades. You see, programs like this work and through the Neighborhood Safety Fund, we can expand them from the ground up under the leadership of people like Hank. We need to recognize the stress our young people live under. After last year's roundtable with the U.S. Surgeon General, County Executive Ronane and I launched the Youth Mental Health Workforce Development Sprint Task Force, which will roll out its recommendations on April 11th. We're also convening a student council of young leaders to hear directly about the challenges they are facing. But it's not just mental health, it's physical too. For the past year, I've been advocating for a ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products in our city. And as we all know, the tobacco industry has a long track record of marketing to communities of color, getting us addicted at a young age, so we'll provide a steady stream of profits, regardless of the cost to our health. Cleveland, Cleveland has one of the highest smoking rates in the country at 35%, 35%, three times the national average. Illnesses caused by cigarettes are the number one killer in Cleveland. Not guns, but cigarettes. And I remember watching my pops come home every night with their fresh pack of Newports. My, da my dad died at a very young age. My grandfather died of lung cancer. I know the impact tobacco can have on a family firsthand. And despite the fact that the Republican Ohio legislature just overrode Governor DeWine's veto to preempt local control of tobacco, we are not giving up in Cleveland. <laughs> nationwide, nationwide Ohio has the second highest number of cities declaring racism a public health crisis. If we believe this, we need to demand a statewide tobacco control policy once and for all. <laughs> next to health, the most important thing we can do for our next generation is provide them with the best in class education system. Last year, while visiting the Seeds of Literacy program. I met Melissa, who at nine years old told her teacher she wanted to be a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. And instead of encouraging this path, her teacher said this, you people should cook or clean houses. Let me say it again. You people should cook or clean houses. Think about that for a second. Discouraged, she dropped out of school. But years later, after raising a family, she went back to school in her 50s. And today, Melissa is a published author.
You see, we need a system that respects and uplifts the hopes and dreams of every student. Students like Melissa deserve inspiration, encouragement, and attention. And I believe, I believe we can achieve this goal under the leadership of Dr. Warren Morgan. He brings, he brings the fresh perspectives and diverse experiences we need to deliver the high quality education every Cleveland student deserves. And as you know, we have hard but necessary choices to make to ensure our children's success. CMSD deserves our full support and partnership to keep it on the right track. We must all invest in the future success of our schools. But we can't continue to operate with an outdated building footprint. Realigning our vision for our schools won't be easy. But know this, know this, students will be at the center of every policy. Our schools were built in an era when Cleveland's population was triple the size. We are overdue to adjust for the here and now. And instead of allocating funds to keep up aging buildings, let's fund after school programs and tools for teachers. At Rhodes High School, the cheerleading squad told me they had to raise their own money for uniforms. Countless principals have told me they can't afford the latest version of textbooks for their students. That's not right. Our kids deserve excellent resources across our schools, from Collinwood to West Park and everywhere in between. <laughs> School leaders should not have to choose between cutting programs and keeping the heat on. And I'm confident in our kids and what our schools can achieve when they have the resources they need. Again, it's the basics, keeping kids safe and healthy and making sure they have mental health support, the tools they need in classroom and internet access to do their homework. Change happens block by block, street by street. Over the summer, I walked through each police district on public safety walks with my cabinet knocking on hundreds of doors and talking to residents about their concerns. And do you know what I heard the most? Not concerns about police presence or crime, but a continuous refrain of that house, that house, that house over there. Residents are concerned about the abandoned, neglected houses in their neighborhoods, many of which become hubs for illegal activity. You see, safety and the built environment are intertwined. And as we walk the neighborhoods, we address residents' concerns in real time. Identifying a code enforcement issue or public safety issue at that house can turn around an entire block and in time transform an entire neighborhood. One such story came to us from Mrs. Richardson on Torbinson Avenue. The lot next to her was plagued by illegal dumping of trees and construction debris. Our building and housing team investigated and found that the materials had been dumped by an out-of-state contractor that was fired and skipped town, leaving behind a whole hot mess for Mrs. Richardson and her neighbors. Our inspector not only helped secure a new contractor, but also found one that worked with neighbors to make sure things got cleaned up and stayed that way. This is how we create the conditions to restore hope in our communities. Last year, we began a cleanup project 
on Kinsman Road. Efforts as simple as picking up trash and planting trees inspired a whole group of neighbors to continue to keep up the street. Hope has the power to create change. And it's a great example of why I'm so confident in Cleveland. Progress is sometimes as simple as picking up trash. And projects like this are popping up across our neighborhoods. Last year, we launched a citywide parks and recreation master planning process, the first in our city's history. Collecting resident input, we found that half, half of Clevelanders don't frequent our parks or rec centers due to quality and safety concerns. This startling finding inspired us to act with urgency to address neglected playgrounds, pools, and parks, the foundation of growing up in a neighborhood. We allocated $30 million in American Rescue Plan funding for capital improvements to roadways, playgrounds, parks, and traffic calming efforts all across the entire city. Again, we dialed in on the basics to work smarter, updating our snow and ice control service with route optimization technology, and adding an additional paving crew to perform in-house road resurfacing. Already this year, the Division of Streets has recycled over 600 tons of asphalt for road and pothole repairs. Thank you, Frank Williams. And that's before the plants are even open for the regular season. Our public works teams are knocking it out of the park. They picked up over 6,700 tons of illegal dumping debris off the streets last year. And for that great work, I awarded the Illegal Dumping Task Force with the inaugural Mayor's Innovation Award. Some of them are here this afternoon. Let's show them some love. Let's give them a round of applause if we can. Our $50 million site readiness for Good Jobs Fund will clean up thousands of acres of vacant lots and brownfields in the shovel-ready sites with the potential to create 60,000 jobs in our neighborhoods. This is how we get Cleveland working again and working for everyone. We've also implemented a new municipal income tax credit program, which reduces the amount of income tax a business pays to the city as an incentive to create and retain good jobs. And these credits are already delivering results. City Council recently approved both property and income tax credits to bring international food solutions along with 225 new jobs to the central neighborhood. In addition to job creation, the company has committed to robust community benefits under the city's new CBA law, including child care subsidies, food donations, a pocket park for the community, and so much more. And these aren't the only new jobs coming to Cleveland. Frontier Airlines just landed a new crew base at Cleveland Hopkins Airport with more than 400 new jobs, generating nearly $80 million annually in local wages. <laughs> 2024 is all about jobs, and we're making changes to our economic development process to create the conditions for growth in our city. We're hiring a director for business attraction and growth, creating a team of neighborhood-based economic development specialists and streamlining archaic permitting processes and outdated building codes to make starting a business in our city easier. <laughs> Family-sustaining jobs that make home ownership possible are the key to building generational wealth. There's a reason owning a home is the American dream. 
It certainly was for my grandparents when they moved up north from the segregated South. But we have an aging housing stock in Cleveland. Too many of our seniors and residents live among blight and decaying conditions. Last year, we allocated $15 million to make overdue home repairs. These funds will also go towards accessible loans for lower income home buyers and minority developers. But it's not just home buyers. City government, city government has fallen short when it comes to protecting renters from absentee landlords. <laughs> Residents and our city's housing stock suffered as a result. With council support, we recently passed Residents First, new legislation that ensures that every resident, regardless of their address, has access to high quality housing. The comprehensive housing reform package closes loopholes that have allowed predatory landlords to take advantage of our residents. It puts a stop to a disturbing trend of out of town investors and local slumlords acquiring Cleveland homes, renting them out, and allowing these properties to deteriorate. Before, the main way we held slumlords accountable was to bring them to court. But guess what? If they don't live here, they don't show up. Councilwoman Gray had to go all the way to New York City to find a landlord who operated in her ward. Councilman Palencic sees folks from Belgium buying up properties in Collinwood. It's hard to hold people in Europe accountable for the conditions of homes here in Cleveland. So here's what we're doing. Today, whether you live in New York or Belgium, to rent property in our city, you have to identify an actual human being who lives in the county to be held responsible for the property. And we're, going to and we're going to start issuing fines against landlords that don't keep their property up. Just like parking tickets, when you get a parking ticket because you parked in front of a hydrant, you move your car. Predatory landlords have been getting a free ride in Cleveland. Those days are over. Over. It also sickens me to my core to think our children are still living in lead-infested homes. When it comes to lead, Cleveland will not tolerate noncompliance, and we're actively streamlining the process to make compliance easier, particularly for landlords with one to three unit properties. Lead inspections are a requirement for every landlord when they apply for a rental permit and we will aggressively prosecute landlords that fail to follow this law. <laughs> Last year alone, 50 property owners were issued multiple misdemeanor charges after it was determined a child at their property had been lead poisoned. And a few weeks ago, we got our first conviction, and there are many more in the pipeline. we are certainly turning the tables on negligent landlords. The pandemic exposed Cleveland's massive digital divide as well and forced us to acknowledge that internet access must be a right, not a privilege. Last fall, we announced two major efforts to bridge this gap. First, we partnered with private te telecom developer Sci-Fi Networks to invest over a half a billion dollars in a citywide fiber network reaching every home and business in Cleveland. At no cost to the city 
and installed and maintained using union labor. But I couldn't ask our residents to wait seven years for broadband access. The need is too urgent. Using federal stimulus dollars, we are working with nonprofit Digital C to expand our broadband network. They are offering high speed internet across Cleveland for just $18 a month. It's already up in Glenville and Collinwood and will be available to every single Cleveland resident next summer. And thanks to the state of Ohio, Digital C just received $10 million to speed this process along. <laughs> Clevelanders living in predominantly black and brown communities are no longer forced to accept being overcharged and underserved for this basic necessity. And we're using the same public-private partnership model across all our work to deliver for Cleveland residents. We can't do it all from City Hall, nor should we. By transferring management or sharing responsibility with experts and organizations whose sole focus is our asset success, we can focus our resources on progress, ensuring our work carries on for generations to come. We transfer care of the historic Highland Park Golf Course to a local nonprofit maintaining it as a space for black golfers, both aspiring and seasoned to enjoy. Now, more than a year into new management, it was ranked one of the most improved public golf courses in America. I was also proud to support Cleveland Neighborhood Progress and Burton Bell Carr in their purchase of Shaker Square to save this historic shopping center. <laughs> Work in Shaker Square and Market Corridors and Lee Harvard, Mount Pleasant and Buckeye are ensuring our Southeast Side Vision promise is no longer just a vision. In addition to a $15 million ARPA investment in the Southeast Side, I'm pleased to announce that this afternoon, we will launch a search for project teams to enhance several publicly owned properties in Cleveland's Lee Harvard neighborhood, totaling, totaling nearly $100 million of new investment coming to the southeast side. We believe that this is a model for reinvestment and renewal citywide. Renewed hope and economic prosperity have profound effects on a neighborhood. Here's one of my favorite examples. For 70 years, Dr. William Walker practiced dentistry for the Lee Harvard community. In that building that housed the family practice, his daughter-in-law, recently opened Docs on Harvard, the first upscale sit-down restaurant to come to the neighborhood in decades. The restaurant is hiring folks from the neighborhood while bringing new excitement and energy to the corridor. To my Southeast Side family, I see you. City Hall sees you and cranes are coming to the Southeast Side. We are celebrating the vitality of the neighborhoods that I came from and working hand in hand to address the issues that we face. As a city, we have historically underinvested in our greatest assets. Our waterfronts are a glaring example. Our lakefront is a place where kids grew up fishing, where families went to grieve after losing a loved one, where Clevelanders from all walks of life gathered to watch fireworks on the 4th of July. Our waterfronts should be places of healing and community, but access to the lakefront is far from equal 
due to decades of division and disinvestment. Now I know that in the last 100 years, there have been dozens upon dozens upon dozens of lakefront plants. <laughs> Since Tom Johnson, I think. But I'm confident that this is the plan. Here's why. We founded the North Coast Waterfront Development Corporation to carry the plan forward across changing leadership and administrations. We put people at the center of every decision. More than 5,000 Clevelanders told us what they want from their waterfronts. And taking a shore-to-core-to-shore -to -core -to -shore approach, our riverfront and lakefront plans will work in tandem to holistically reshape our city. And by implementing the Tax Increment Financing District passed by City Council on Monday, we're using a portion of increased property tax value to pay for the public infrastructure that plan requires. This, this is how we stop managing decline and begin to grow once again. The TIF district has the potential to generate between 3.3 to $7.5 billion over the next 40 years to make Cleveland one of the nation's finest two waterfront cities with additional growth to invest in neighborhoods and green spaces citywide. Real progress on our waterfront. And as chair of Climate Mayors, I'm committed to ensuring federal funding benefits communities of color and those most vulnerable to climate change. Our plans for the lakefront and riverfront are designed to prepare us to combat flooding and extreme weather. In fact, the city of Cleveland has pledged a 50% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. And as our nation and our planet continue to feel the effects of climate change, what we have here in Cleveland is increasingly attractive, an opportunity to grow our population after decades of stagnation and decline. This is our time, Cleveland, and people are taking notice of the transformation happening here, recognizing us as a competitive, attractive city that thinks outside the box to tackle systemic problems. You see, Meeting this moment will require hard choices, but greatness, greatness takes hard choices. And over the past two years, we haven't shied away from our toughest challenges, and we won't start now. We've, we've reset relationships, we've taken on predatory landlords, we've delivered on a modern city hall, we've been bold in our vision for our waterfronts and the southeast side. We've achieved real results in our strategy to address public safety. But many of the challenges we face today have been built up over generations. That's not an excuse. It's a reminder that change doesn't happen overnight. But I'm not going to tell you to be patient. Instead, I ask you to stay engaged, demand better, and be proud of the progress we are making together. A few weeks ago, during his State of the Union, President Biden reminded us that America is the land of turning setbacks into comebacks. When we get knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. Here in Cleveland, we keep going. <laughs> Together, we have set in motion a wave of renewal. We're creating new jobs, 
paving pathways to home ownership, improving our neighborhoods, and building a safer, stronger city for every resident. Together, we are making Cleveland a place in this country where the American dream is still within reach for everyone. The state of our city is strong and we're just getting started. God bless you all. God bless our great city and God bless our great country. Thank you so much. Mr. Mayor, yeah. I have listened to or attended all of your State of the City addresses, and you continue to inspire me. Thank you. Thank you for all you Thank do. You. Thank you. Quick question for you. It, it, you talked at the beginning about our need to regain our confidence, and I was backstage listening to you thinking, I'm not sure you ever lost yours. <laughs> and I just wonder what you do every day to stay confident, optimistic, have the can-do attitude that you have. What, what is the best part mm. of every work day for you? To me, I think about the people that are depending on our team at City Hall to deliver. You know, I think about the single mom trying to work two jobs to put food on the table. I think about the first responder who risks their life every single day to keep our city safe and secure. And so, you know, having them in mind to me is the, the best motivation I have to make sure I'm showing up every day to serve as mayor of this great city. As I was listening to you, I was thinking, a mentor once said to me, uh, leadership is not a closed book exam. <laughs> and, and you clearly signaled throughout your address that you lean on people. 5,000 people provided input on the waterfront. You heard from students. You've listened to your wise mentors across the city. And that seems like that's a big part of your leadership, yes? Yeah, one of the things I talked about throughout uh, the campaign when I was running for mayor was we needed a government that truly centered every decision on resident voice. Um, and I think the work we've done to engage residents on our waterfront process is a prime example of centering uh, the lived experiences of our residents and some of the biggest issues we're facing at City Hall. Well, let's, let's, let's turn right now to some of those residents and the questions that they've okay. posed for you. We're going to hear first about the question about economic development, Great. Mr. Mayor, and it's from uh, Juan Molina Crespo, uh, who is doing a lot of economic development work in the city, particularly over in La Villa Hispana. Let's hear what he has to say. My name is Juan Molina Crespo. I'm the director of Consultamos. It's critically important that the city and the region understand and completely comprehends the value of the growing Latino market. We really are part of an engine that creates economic development, not just in the Latino community, but throughout the city and throughout the region. La Villa Hispana is that. La Villa Hispana is a concept that transcends the Clark Fulton area where we has historically have been uh, identified as residents of this particular area. But when you go throughout the, the west side, we have multiple businesses on Memphis Avenue. We have multiple businesses on Ridge Avenue. So my question to you, sir, is how is it that you can assure the community that your administration will create the kinds of connections with our community leadership, our organizations, and our businesses so that we can continue to help you help us. Here you go, there's Thanks. your first question. It's an important question. You know, one of the things that we've recognized over the last two years at City Hall is historically, we haven't had the right systems in place to deploy economic development in neighborhoods that was as responsive as we need to be. That's why we were structuring our Department of Economic Development. So instead of having one person inside our Department of Economic Development focused on neighborhood-based development, uh, having a specialist in every ward to identify what are the pain points, what are the opportunities, and how do we make sure that as we're creating economic development policy, they're based on feedback from residents. The other thing I would say as part of our modern city hall agenda is we need to do a better job of translating everything we're doing at city hall that reflects the diversity of our great city. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as I said in my state of the city address, 
you know, we hired Ernst & Young to help us think about how do we change all of our systems and processes from the new wayfinding that you're going to see at City Hall that is going to be more than English but various languages to um, creating mobile city halls in neighborhoods where folks don't have to catch two buses to come and do business with us where they can get it done in the neighborhood. Government should come to people, not the other way around most times. And I think that's one thing we're trying to do to make sure we're meeting the conditions of our neighborhoods and residents. Yeah. You, you recently named somebody to the CMSD school board who's a colleague of mine, a Latina woman at, yes. at CSU, and every day she reminds me when I talk with her about the rich Latinx mm. community in Cleveland, and I think about the jobs that you talked about, and I imagine that that's a priority, thinking about how we make sure that Absolutely. all of our cultural groups are, are represented there. So let's turn to public safety. You talked yep. a lot about that, and, and again, those of us backstage had a collective gasp when you said 10 years. It's been 10 years since this community lost Tamir yeah. Rice. That's remarkable. Yeah. Lots, a lot has happened. Um, this question comes from Maisha Watkins, uh, who is the executive director of the Cleveland Peacemakers Alliance, who's focused every day on public safety and peacemaking. Let's hear what she has to say. My name is Maisha Watkins, executive director of Cleveland Peacemakers Incorporated. The work that I do um, in the city of Cleveland and surrounding communities is called community violence intervention. And it's a, it's a grassroots practice that supports victims and perpetrators of gun violence, those who are at the highest risk of shooting or being shot, giving them solu solutions to reduce the barriers that put them at risk of choosing violence. And as I continue to navigate, I suppressed that moment and I was reminded in uh, 2020 when gun violence was really, really high and people were being impacted that I have not been shot, but I have been impacted and that fear allows me to show up for those who are indirectly impacted by gun violence. Mayor Bibb, <laughs> thank you so much for um, the investment in the Neighborhood Safety Fund. That's an amazing start to community violence intervention and hoping to build off of that. My question is how do we work together to utilize the technology of Shot Spotter to use that data to complement CBI so that we can do more intervention work that's less punitive and support those who are at the highest risk of shooting or being shot. Shot spotters. Yeah. And, you know, at the onset, I think it's important to recognize that in some cities across the country, shot spotter is controversial. Mm -hmm. And I have certainly have done um, my research on it. My cabinet has as well, too. We're working with CSU to really investigate that service and that product. But I will say this, when you look at the nature of gun violence in our city and the fact that in many cases, folks don't dial 911, having that technology is so important. I talked about it earlier, 40 li nearly 40, 40 lives have been saved because of ShotSpotter. But it's not just the technology that's important, but it's the intelligence surrounding that technology. So for example, when you see a shell casing on our neighborhoods after a shooting, because we're working with the U.S. Attorney and ATF now, we can take that shell casing data through a technology called NIBIN and trace every issue of violent crime where that gun has been involved in. That's why we have a nearly 80% homicide solve rate. So ShotSpotter is a key part of the equation in terms of Get, giving families justice when they lose someone to gun violence. I would also say this, you know, we have to think differently about how we police in the 21st century. That's why having this new gun crime intelligence center is so important because if I can't uh, get Columbus to give me more tools to pass common sense gun reform, then I have to use every tool I can to keep Cleveland safe, and I'm gonna keep doing that as long as I'm mayor of this great city. So I, I just want to follow up on what you said about 21st century policing. Yeah. Technology is a huge part of yep. it, right? Yep. And so where do, you, where do you secure the resources for the kind of advanced technology that we must have to do this? Well, I just want to double down on that part of it, give you the opportunity. Yeah, to I, I have to say, um, we are living in a very lucky moment right now because we have a president 
in D.C. and Joe Biden, who cares about American cities. And everything that we put forth in my administration, you know, we, have, we would not have been able to do it without the support of the federal government. And so it's so important that we work with the federal government and the state government to get more than our fair share uh, in Cleveland. Uh, and so having that partnership has been very critical in terms of the investments we've been able to get to really address public safety in our city. I'm grateful for the partnership. Yep. I mean, right next door here, to, right next door to yep. uh, Playoff Square at CSU, and I know that our CSU Police Department and the Cleveland Police Department work closely together, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Let's, let's turn to education. You and I have talked a lot about this, and I think we share a fundamental belief that a lot, a lot of what will enable us to thrive in the future has its roots in education. Um, the next person we're going to hear from is a junior at the Cleveland School of Architecture and Design, Morgan Overby. Let's hear what Morgan has to say. I heard, that's my baby. I love that. I love that. Let's hear from your baby. So my name is Morgan Overby. I am in the 11th grade and I live in like Midtown East Cleveland. My favorite part is the interactions that I get to have, like my teachers. I love my teachers, students. They're all very interesting, and so it's really fun to go to school, and it kind of always has been. My plans for the future are is to go to college. Um, I like I would like to double major in psychology and political science, and then med school, and then eventually become a doctor. The toughest part about being a student today is kind of balancing having access to all the answers online and try and be honest. Because there's times where you're like, okay, I don't know the answer. I can look it up. But sometimes it's better to just fail and figure it out from there. My question for the mayor is, what are things being done outside in the city that is gonna have an impact on the school district? I'd follow Morgan anywhere. Yeah. That's impressive. She should run for mayor. <laughs> Give her a year or yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we're seeing right now in education in general, and I know you're seeing this too, Dr. Bloomberg at Cleveland State, is the pandemic has really forced us to think differently about the value proposition of education. It has indeed. And I really believe that we should be pivoting the, the business model of education to really focus on ensuring Every child has a plan for college or job when they leave CMSD. And I was talking to a group of students in the Red Room a couple weeks ago, and I asked them this one question. Um, I asked them, if you could work and go to school at the same time in high school, earn while you learn, would you do it? Every kid raised their hand. Yeah. So what does that tell me? It tells me that if you're a freshman at, at a CMSD high school and you want to be a AI machine learning analyst, we should be putting you in the Cleveland Clinic your freshman year of high school, shadowing somebody, exposing them early on. Mm -hmm. And so we're working very closely with our leadership at the Workforce Investment Board, CMSD, and others to really make sure that we are exposing young people early on because the old saying goes, you are what you see. You are what you see. And if we don't do a better job of giving them that access, then we're undermining our potential to ensure that every scholar inside CMSD can achieve their own God-given potential. The other thing I would say, when the Surgeon General came to Cleveland to visit us last spring, I was just so moved by the challenges facing our students when it comes to mental health. And when I talked to a majority of the students, all of them told me that they would want a uh, therapist for themselves and somebody in their house. Wow. Yeah. It goes to show you how mental health and trauma is, 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 is a major barrier for many of our young people in our city. 
And so the work we're doing with the county executive and the Workforce Investment Board to make sure we have a pipeline of behavioral health uh, workers in this sector mm -hmm. is so important because if we don't have folks in the workforce development system that can serve these children, then we can't meet their basic needs. And so that's why the investments in Say Yes are so important mm -hmm. because really addressing the social and emotional supports are fundamental for any kid to succeed in today's world. Thank you for that. I, yeah. That's our hook. That's